Hi, Dr. B here. In this episode, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I remember about memory. And along the way, we're going to try a couple of demonstrations to make some of this all hit home. So uh, previously, I asked you what your earliest memory was. And I've been enjoying uh, reading about them. And I shared with you mine. And uh, one of the questions that I had you think about was, why don't you remember anything earlier? You know, most of you were remembering things like me from maybe about uh, four, three, maybe. Not too many of us remember things very, very clearly when we were two or younger. And um, why is that? Well, um, for example, I can't remember being born. You know, talk about a talk about a, a traumatic day. You know, why wouldn't we remember that? Well, the answer, I think, is rather simple. You know, we have a big name for it, childhood, childhood amnesia. It makes it sound like it's some kind of disorder or something. Um, I wouldn't call it a disorder. Uh, basically, the uh, the frontal lobe part of our brains, in fact, a good portion of our brain, is, uh, is not yet fully cooked. All of the parts, pretty much, that we're going to ever have are there. We're born with just about all the neurons that we're ever going to have in life. But they're nowhere near yet. Um, completely connected. They'll continue to grow connections well throughout your lifetime, but uh, really in a pronounced way well into, well into your 20s, perhaps as old as you are now. So um, the simple answer is just that we don't remember things from that earlier age just because the brain isn't quite fully connected yet. And then if you add on top of that um, higher level kind of things like the importance of language, if you stop and think how important language is to your memory, um, you know, thought and memory is often really nothing more than thinking to yourself, speaking to yourself. When we think, we think, we, you know, we, we silently speak to ourselves. And if you don't yet have a language to do that in, um, makes, uh, it makes thinking difficult, it makes remembering difficult, it makes processing what you're experiencing a little bit, um, a little bit difficult. So those are the biggest reasons why I think we just don't remember things from, from those first several years of life. Well, let's take another little memory test here. So <clears throat> for this one, I want you to pull out a sheet of paper or something that you can jot some, some answers down on, okay? So pause the video now, go find something to write on and something to write with, and uh, do it. Seriously, hit the pause button. I want you to pause. Hit the pause button on your computer, please. <laughs> Get out a sheet of paper and do this. All right. I want you to write down as many of the the names of the seven dwarfs from the Snow White story, as you can recall. No cheating, no Googling, put your phone down. Um, don't, you know, don't look it up, don't cheat, okay? So jot down as many of those seven dwarfs as you can recall. Uh, if English isn't your primary language and you learned, uh, you know, no other names for these characters, use those, go ahead. All right, so hit pause and write down as many of the seven dwarfs as you can recall. I'll wait here. Did you find this difficult? How many did you get? Um, if you didn't get all seven of them, why? Why not? Um, were there any names that were easier for you to remember? Um, do you th do you th why do you think the first names on your list popped into your head? If you didn't get all of them, um, wh what do you think went wrong? Uh, I hope you haven't looked yet. I don't want you to look at the answers yet, so don't, l don't look them up yet. I'll, of course, reveal them in just a moment. But first, I have another task to have you do. Um, Take a moment and pause and think about what kinds of strategies you used. What did you? How did you? How did you try rolling through your memory to get the names of these seven dwarfs? Did you try visualizing them? Did you go looking for a song? Sometimes songs are very helpful. Think how think how um, think how, how vivid your memory is for the lyrics for songs. You can hear a song on a radio um, years after, since you've heard it last and immediately. Um, start singing it. But then again, you go to karaoke and you get the microphone in your hand and uh, when, when you don't hear the singer and you're not actually singing along, oh, all of a sudden those lyrics are gone, aren't they? It's even challenging when you're trying to read the lyrics and you can't hear the, the real singer singing them. Okay, so um, the memory for lyrics is a, is a really complicated thing. It seems to be right there, but we're much better at singing along than we are at conjuring up the lyrics all by ourselves, even with the music, even with the real accompanying music playing. So anyway, uh, there, there doesn't, uh, there's no Seven Dwarfs song from 
this from the Snow White movie or anything like that, those cartoons. So um, you couldn't probably, you know, you couldn't fall back on, on that as a sort of mnemonic to help you remember them. So maybe you tried visualizing them, maybe you thought you were way through the story. Anyway, um, we all use different strategies. So here's a list of possible dwarf names. All right, so hit pause again and um, jot down you know the numbers of the of the ones that you think are the real seven dwarfs and you if you if you don't know them if you couldn't remember them you might find uh, all these other names a little bit distracting um or even if you thought you knew them maybe some of these other names um wind up distracting you so hit pause try to find the the real seven dwarfs in the list here Okay, well, here they are, all right? So the real seven dwarfs are Sleepy, Dopey, Grumpy, Sneezy, Happy, Doc, and Bashful, all right? So if you missed any, which ones did you miss? It's too bad we can't, um, we can't uh, raise our hands and or, you know, say out loud what, uh, which ones we missed. So um, there's certain ones that, that seem to be remembered uh, more, more readily. Um, people seem to remember Dopey. See, people seem to remember Sleepy and Happy and, and Sneezy, but uh, I find Bashful and Doc to be in, and then grumpy to be um, a little bit harder for, for people to remember. All right. Now again, um, some of you don't speak English as your first or even your second language, so uh, here's a list of some other some other popular uh, common languages. So um, maybe you can let me know if any of these are wrong. So I did a little homework to find out um, what they're what they're called in other languages. So here they are. And of course, my favorite. Uh. is the Simpsons version, the seven duffs. Edgy, remorseful, dizzy, tipsy, surly, queasy, and sleazy. All right. Okay. Now, without looking at your list, without rewinding, try again. Can you name the real seven dwarfs? You just saw them. You just saw them on a list. You just heard me read them and say them. You saw their pictures uh, just a moment ago. Can you remember them? Funny if you couldn't, huh? Memory's a strange thing. Okay, um, I don't have time to talk about everything that there is to talk about with memory, so I'm not, I can't cover everything. So I'm going to cover just a few uh, a few key things here. And um, in, an, in, a, in another ep in another video, I, I had much to say about um, patients a uh, patients HM and EP. And uh, I posted up uh, something for you to watch if you were interested about another famous amnesic named Clive Wearing. And um, these are uh, very fascinating cases, and I've had much to say about them elsewhere, so I'm not going to say much more about them now. But just a reminder of some of the main things that we learned from HM. Um, we, uh, we learned a, a heck of a lot about memory from this poor man. And... Um, uh, we, wrote, we, we learned what the role of the hippocampus is in memory. Now, the hippocampus, remember, is not where memories are stored. They're um, kind of like a card catalog. They're an indexing system. They're kind of the processing unit, if you will, for, for laying down certain kinds of memories. Okay? So without, without most of the hippocampus, um, HM was, had you know, difficulty laying down a particular new kind of new memory. So we learned where memories aren't stored, they're not stored in the hippocampus, but that, that those structures are absolutely important for laying down, um, sh you know, taking short-term information, short-term memories, and converting them to long-term memories. And we learned about the difference between de so-called declarative and procedural memories, sometimes called explicit and, and implicit memories. Okay, um, a declarative memory again is um, when you can declare, when you can, when you can, um, when you remember the stories, when you remember a story about maybe you know learning to ride a bicycle. On the other hand, riding the bicycle itself is a procedural memory. So HM had intact the ability to re to to lay down new procedural memories. All right, they gave him the classic example was the mirror t drawing task. And um, through practice, you can learn that procedure and you can get better at it, okay? Now, they did that with him day after day. And, of course, every time you took the mirror away, a few seconds, a few minutes later, he'd have no memory of it. So you, no matter how many times they, they had him do it, he, um, he, he, never, he thought he never had done it before. In fact, he surprised himself as he got better and better at it. He thought, he, 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 was, he was known to have said, you know, I would have thought this, gee, I thought this was going to be harder. Um, so he had no memory of having done it, but um, he was able to lay down new procedures, 
of that memory, you know, to remember how to do it. Um, likewise, you know, he had to, on occasion, he had to move um, homes. You know, he was in nursing homes, and um, you could interview him, and you could talk to him, and you could say, um, you know, how's the food of, in the cafeteria here? Oh, I don't think I've ever been there. I don't know. Um, well, do you know where it is? No, I don't think I've ever been there. Well, let's go see if we can find it. Well, he could get up and walk right to it. He'd have a memory for the procedure of walking to that location. So he knew his way around because he could remember those kinds of procedures. But he couldn't declare where the cafeteria or anything else was. Okay, enough about HM. Um, memory in the movies, particularly amnesia, is a very common theme, all right? So Hollywood loves to, they love this theme. So tons of movies have been made about um, about memory. Um, here's a handful of some better ones and some worse ones. And of course, here in Hawaii, we have to we have to give props to, uh, to uh, Adam Sandler and Drew Barrymore in uh, 50 First Dates filmed here, okay? Um, clever, funny movie. I enjoyed it, but um, um, of course, that's not... That's never how uh, this kind of amnesia works, where if you saw the movie, um, it would hers would reset every evening. So she'd wake up in the next, you know, the next morning and have no memory of the day before, but she'd have a full memory of a full day. And of course, that's not at all how memory works and amnesia works. So it was a fun movie, but that's not very realistic. Okay. Um, a couple of honorable ex exceptions to this. Um, this this movie, uh, I'm going to throw, you know, here it is. Uh, I got to admit, I've never seen this movie, and I keep saying I've got to dig this movie out and watch it. And um, I'll have to admit, I haven't yet. But it supposedly does a good job of of relaying the kind of um, anterograde amnesia that these kinds of patients have. Uh, another typical, you know, another kind of patient are, are people with something called Korsakoff syndrome, which is, uh, which is typically associated with drinking. Now, you often hear, by the way, that, that drinking kills brain cells. You know, we, all, we always hear that phrase, okay, and we, we, you know, some people joke about it when they go out to drink, you know, I'm going to go kill a few brain cells. Now, um, I want to clear up a little myth. Uh, alcohol doesn't directly kill brain cells. So Korsakoff syndrome, while it is associated with uh, chronic alcoholics, it's not the alcohol that um, kills or burns out the, the you know the brain cells and destroys memory. It has to do with a, it's a nutrition thing. People who are alcoholic get a great deal of their daily calories from from alcohol, which are as you know pro you know, probably know are empty calories, and they have all they have deficits of other key minerals and nutrients and vitamins and so on. So Korsakoff's is an indirect effect of alcohol abuse, but it's not caused by the alcohol itself. So anyway, um, go watch this movie. Tell me how it is, because I haven't seen it yet. i got to go see if it's on Netflix or somewhere and see if I can find it. I have seen this movie, Memento, and I highly recommend it. It's a fantastic movie. It's a good movie in its own right, and it does a really good job of portraying what this must feel like, this, this, this sim these symptoms that um, HM had, this kind of memory loss. So um, very clever, very edgy kind of movie, and uh, check it out if you've never seen it. Definitely recommend it. Memento. And um, we probably all have seen Finding Nemo, all right? Dora, um, Dory has, is, a, is a character in the movie, and um, it's a pretty good uh, depiction of anterograde amnesia. Okay, Finding Nemo. All right, so um, I want to make a few points, and we'll have yet another demonstration coming up of memory here. And um, I want to make the point that um, memory is not like... Uh, uh, it's often likened to the, the current best technology of the day, all right? So memory is um, often compared to things like uh, cameras or video, uh, video cameras, um, you know, tape recordings and things like that, okay? The brain doesn't work anything like that. Uh, it's a very common myth that it's all getting in there. It's all in your brain somewhere, and you just can't find the right reel of film, or you can't find the play button when you're forgetting something or can't recall something very clearly. And if you could just find that play button, it would come out, you know, fully faithfully recorded, just like it would be on tape or digital or something like that. Okay? And we now know that memory is absolutely nothing like that. It's a very, uh, it's a very reconstructive process. And indeed, experience the present that you know our experience of the present is a very constructive um, process we're all chugging along creating our own reality 
two people can sit side by side and have the very same experience and construct their very own reality of what's going on and walk away with two entirely different impressions of what's going on. You've all experienced that. You're with friends and you have different opinions about a movie you're just watching or a conversation or a fight that you know two or more of you are having and you walk away and you have very different impressions or memories of, of what just happened to, to, to all of you. So we're chugging along, constructing our reality, constructing our present. So it shouldn't be very surprising when we think back and we reflect on the past, which is, you know, everything uh, from just a few seconds ago is the past. It's, you know, what you, what you think is the present, which is, which is still here, is gone. The beginning of this video is gone. You can rewind it and play it again, but your experience of having watched it, it's it's the past. When I first put this slide up, that was in the past. It's not the present, okay? Um, when we recall the past, it's a reconstructive process of a constructive process at the time. So you can, you can see how memory can, can be very faulty then, okay? We're trying to reconstruct something that was a construction to, to begin with, all right? So it's very uh, very tricky kind of thing. So, memory is selective, as we of course know. Recovering a memory is not playing a videotape, all right? Um, so, we all experience very often a kind of amnesia. We're, 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 almost every day we probably experience um, periods of, of amnesia, episodes of amnesia. So one particular very common kind is called source amnesia, the inability to distinguish what originally experienced from what you heard or later, you were told later about an event. Okay, we, um, you know, if you, anytime you, anytime you, you know, oh, I can't remember where I heard this or, you know, did I read it? Did I see it in a book? Did I, did I hear it on TV? Did someone tell me? Okay, very often um, we can't remember the source of, of, a, of of a, an experience or a memory, okay? And uh, we sometimes make mistakes. So we see it on TV and we think we thought of it ourselves or we think a friend told us or a friend told us and we're convinced we read it in a book or and so on and so on. Another term that um, is that we use all the time in memory research is confabulation, all right? That sounds like a confabulated word, doesn't it? Confabulation, all right? Um, this is a confusion of an event that happened to someone else with one that happened to you, or the belief that you know you remember something when it never actually happened, all right? Um, and similar to source amnesia. So sometimes um, you know you hear a friend's story, and it, and later you recall it as your own, all right? Um, I can very clearly, I re very clearly remember um, a, f a friend of mine from graduate school. When I saw him years later, we were talking about memory. He's a professor too, and he teaches intro to psych classes just like I am and um, he started telling me this story of, of a story uh, something a story that he tells his students about as, about memory and 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 learning and uh, I won't bore you the story but as he started telling me this I was like dude that wasn't you that was me that's my story and he was like no no and I was like you know, it had to do with a car that I owned, and and it was mine. It was my car, you know. And he was in the car with me when the particular thing happened. And not only did he mistakenly remember it to be his own story about his own car, and I was nowhere in it, but it was absolutely the other way around. He was in the passenger seat with me. It was a detail about my car, and. Um, um, I had, I had, I was able to, you know, I had evidence of it, you know, because I could describe the car and the year and all, you know, it was absolutely my car, okay? So, um, he had totally confabulated um, a story uh, that he was using in classes to make a point about memory and learning, and I find that very ironic and funny. All right, so it happens to the best of us, all right, including me too. My story that I told you, my first memory, um, is, is a confabulation, all right? I have this memory of me running around in a bathroom, but since I'm watching it from a third-person perspective, even though it s feels so strongly like it's my own memory and that it's me doing the running, um, it's most certainly a confabulation of some, you know me watching one of my sisters run, and I just uh, incorporated it as my own memory, okay? So the confabulation. Now, um, one type of memory that's thought to be very sturdy and steady and reliable is sometimes called a, a flashbulb memory, all right? Flashbulb memories from that old technology of a camera with the flash cubes, all right? You'd put a bulb on there and take a flash and the flash bulb would flash and it would kind of, you know, 
you've all had a photograph taken where somebody's used their flash, then you have that uh, that green spot that blinds you and follows you and lingers for a long time afterwards, okay? So, you know, burned in your vision, all right? So that's the metaphor here, that a, a memory so emotional, so powerful, gets burned into your memory like that image of a flash bulb. And um, it's, again, it's usually associated with some highly powerfully emotional uh, event or situation. So, um, um, you know, people remember, people who are alive and old enough, remember what they were doing, you know, where they were and what they were doing the morning of September 11th, okay, 2001, when, you know, 9-11. Um, gosh, I'm finding that, asking students that, um, is not become, it's not a very good example of, of fa a flashbulb memory that students have anymore because I, you guys were, what, um, six to ten years old in 2001, and uh, by gosh, you know, maybe you don't have a flashbulb memory of 9-11, of so I don't know, maybe, um, what's another big world event? And the, some of the past ones were, you know, and this was way before my day, um, well, maybe not way before, but before my day, um, People with the, the classic example was, you know, people would remember where they were and what they were doing when they heard that John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Okay, uh, my generation could probably remember what, you know, sadly, my generation could remember what they were doing when Ronald Reagan was shot and almost killed. Um, when the when either one of the two space shuttles exploded on takeoff and landing, okay, um, highly emotional events and. And people can remember what they were doing when those things happened. Um, maybe a more recent one, I don't know. Do you remember what you were doing when you heard that Michael Jackson died? Okay, fairly recent, a few years old. Okay, so anyway, highly emotional events. People think, seem to think that those are very memorable, and they, they rely, they think that's a very reliable, accurate kind of memory. But we're finding that even those can be very faulty. So when we can verify the content of the memory and, and assess whether it's accurate or not, very often we find that despite how strong someone is in their feeling or opinion that it's correct, that it's wrong, okay? It happens to the best of us, okay? Um, no, one, no less than George, President George W. Bush ha has had an, an example of a, you know, an incorrect, you know, false flashbulb memory. So just two months, less than two months after the, the attacks in 9-11, uh, twice, on, you know, in media events, he, he made the, this re remarkably preposterous claim that he had watched the first attack live on television. Okay? Nobody, nobody watched the, the first plane hit the building live on television, all right? We didn't even see footage of that the first day, all right? It turned out somebody, one or more people did have happened, to, you know, very coincidentally have, have, you know, caught it on handheld cameras and whatnot. And so those only made it to the media and made it to our consciousness like, a, I think, a day later, all right? So nobody on the day watched the first plane hit, okay? Much less as it was happening live. He, he, he claimed to have been watching it live, all right? So, um, obviously a very emotional day for everyone, especially, in inclu especially including him. You can imagine how emotional that must be for a sitting president to have something like that happen, you know, on your watch. So it's maybe I can forgive him for, uh, for having this, this faulty memory, all right? Um, I'm, Plenty of things that I could make fun about George Bush for. I'm not going to make fun of this one, all right? But it is interesting that um, uh, even perhaps after being, um, I would imagine people tried to correct him after he made the claim the first time. He got on the cameras and said it a second time within the two months that he had watched it on television, okay? Um, people saw the second plane hit, but nobody saw the first plane live on television. Okay, let's try another memory test. I know, boy, you love tests and you love memory tests. So um, pause and find another sheet or pull, you know, flip over to the other side of that piece of paper, um, get something you can write on and put it, but put it aside for later, okay? Don't write anything yet. Have it, have it ready to go. So in a moment, I'm going to show you uh, the, the simplest possible memory test I can give you. I'm going to, I'm going to show you and say a word. You're going to see one word appear on the screen at a time. Okay? Try to mentally recall as many of the words as you can. Don't write them down. Just try to remember them. Okay? So a handful of words. Try to remember these words. Okay? Here we go. Get, um, 
try not to be distracted here. So for about 30 seconds, I want you to listen to these words. Night. Blanket. Doze. Wake. Slumber. Dream. Pillow. Bed. Awake. Yawn. Tired. Snore. Rest. Okay, pause. Hit that pause button. Write down as many of those words while they're fresh on your memory as you can, okay? Do it. Please do it. Hit the pause. Hit the pause button. Write them down, okay? It's not that hard. Do it. Don't be embarrassed, okay? Um, very few people remember them all. Do it. Okay. All right. Now, uh, how many did you, re did you recall? There were 13 words, okay? Did you, did you get 13? Do you have 13 words on your list? Do you have more than 13 words, okay? Uh, Maybe a little strange if you have more than 13. Um, don't feel bad if you don't have even 10 or more, okay? Uh, don't feel bad if you only got half of them. Don't feel bad no matter what happens, okay? There's no consequences for having you know, missed these words, all right? But if you really listened and you really tried, um, um, it's hard. It's a very difficult task, okay? So, um, let me ask you, uh, you know, just answer quietly to yourself if you heard these, if you remember seeing or hearing these words, okay? So, do you, you know, do you recall the word, um, do you recall the word pillow? Yes or no? How about, um, slumber? Yes or no? How about blanket? Chair? Snooze. Sleep. Peanut. Aardvark. Okay. All right. Well, um, take a look at the answers that you just had. Um, I'll ask some of them in a moment again. So I want you to now think about something different. I want you to think about... Um, Think about how sure you are, all right? So I'm going to ask you some of those words again, and you, you on, a, on a scale of 0 to 100%, answer in your mind or jot them down. Jot them down. How, how, how certain you are that you saw the word on the list, okay? And likewise, next to that, okay? So if, you know, if you're 90% if you're sure, right? 90% sure, okay? So anyway, next to that, I want you to write an R or a K, all right? So write an R if you can remember hearing the word or seeing the word. If you actually remember seeing it, if you remember the word, you actually remember hearing it, you remember the sound of my voice, or you remember what the word looked like on the screen, if you can actually remember the word, then you would give it an R for remember. On the other hand, if you were just like, gosh, I'm quite certain I, you know, I heard the word, um, but I don't actually remember it. I just know it was on the list. I know he said it. I know I saw it. Okay. Then give it a K. All right. So R versus K. Does that make any sense? Okay. So, um, you know, if you went, uh, if you went to a movie recently with a friend and you can remember that, okay, you can remember going to the movie. On the other hand, um, um, do you remember learning your name? Gosh, no, you don't remember learning your name. You just know it's your name. That's the kind of memory that I, I just know this is true. I know this is accurate, okay? Um, did you go to, you know, anyway. So the, we make a distinction between actually remembering and just knowing something implicitly, okay? All right, so here's some of those words again um, in any particular order. So jot down how certain you are and whether you remember or know that the word was on the list, okay? So... Blanket. How sure are you? Do you remember it or do you just know it? So, um, sleep. How sure? Do you remember or do you just know it? Chair. How certain are you? Do you remember or do you know that it's not on the list? Oops. Gave it away, didn't I? Nobody remembers the word chair. Okay, it wasn't on the list, all right? Nobody gets that one wrong. Okay, so, but do you remember that's not on the list or do you just know that it's not on the list? All right.
uh, I don't remember what first word I said. How about slumber? Do you remember the word slumber? Okay. Anyway, we could go on like this, and you would make a distinction about how sure you are and whether you know or remember. Okay? So I want to I ask you now about one particular word. All right? So look on your list that you wrote down of the words. Did you, do you have the word sleep on there? A moment ago I asked you if sleep was on the word, and chances are really good that you thought that it was, and that you said that it was. You might have even said you remember hearing it. But take a look at my list. The word sleep was never said, and it was not on the list. Okay? So if you wrote it down, if you, re if you said yes, that was on the list, if you said, if you gave it a high percentage, certain, if you said that you remember the word, ladies and gentlemen, you just experienced what we call a false memory. I implanted a false memory. Now, obviously, sleep is the one word that's associated with all of these words, and it's the missing word. So perhaps it's not surprising that a, that a list like this can generate a false memory. But what's surprising is is some of the details about it. So, um, um, most people will, re will have a false memory, so you're not alone. So don't feel bad if you wrote it on your list. Um, 60, well, six, perhaps 60 percent or so might, re you know, might have put it on their list, okay? Um, and and, and th that task, by the way, is called a, a recall task. You're asked to freely recall something. That's a recall test. When you take a test and you have to write an essay and freely recall the answers, that's a recall test. Another type of memory test is a recognition test. So multiple choice questions are sometimes considered to be, rec you know, do you recognize the right answer? When I asked you, was the word blanket on there? Was the word um, slumber on the, on the list? Okay. Those, you know, do you recognize the word? All right. Well, a re uh, uh, for recognition tests, some, you know, better than 80, 85 percent of people will raise their hand or indicate that they, re, you know, that they remember seeing the word sleep on their list. So don't feel bad if you remembered it. Don't feel, and they will be certain. If you're sitting here thinking, I know he said, rewind it and listen to the list again. No matter how many times you watch and listen to you won't see the word or hear the word sleep on that list. I promise you it's not there. Okay? And yet it can create this really strong, vivid memory that you heard the word. Okay? So, uh, in memory research and memory in, in testing recall, there's something that uh, very f f uh, pop f um, very common phenomenon that pops up called the serial position effect, and it's basically that we remember things at the beginning of lists or the beginning of movies or the beginning of lectures or conversations or the beginning of situations. We remember things very well f at the beginning, and then things start to drop off in the middle of a movie, in the middle middle of a lecture, um, later on when we recalled about that information. That content it's harder to remember, harder to grasp, um, harder to get back. Okay, and then we remember things well at the end, a little bit better at the end than at the beginning. So we call that a primacy effect and a recency effect for stuff at the end and stuff at the beginning. All right, so um, we see that kind of thing on the on the word lists. Okay, so um, on your on your list, you are a little bit more likely to recall the first maybe you know two three four words on the list. Not so well on the middle of the list, and then you probably were good at remembering the last three, four, five words of the list. Okay, and um, and so we see a primacy recency effect uh, for for that list. Okay, what's also interesting is where the word sleep often pops up. Sleep often pops up right at the beginning or right at the end. Okay, during that primacy recency effect. So we have a false uh, a false memory that's that that pops up. Okay, and it's more likely to, that word sleep is more likely to re be remembered than words in the middle of the list, words that were actually on the list, whether you're recalling or doing a, a recognition test. People will remember that false word better than words in the middle that were actually on the list. I find that really fascinating. Okay, so so called false memories. So, um, um, this is sometimes related to something called the misinformation effect, okay? And it's kind of like the confabulation. All this is very related, okay? It's a, a misinformation effect is a distortion of memory by exposure to misleading information, okay? So, um, you know, when, it, when, you get, when you get fed wrong information, whether it's in books, on TV, in the media, from professors, um, from teachers, it's, um, 
that stuff can get incorporated, you know, just as readily and just as strongly into memory as anything else. So, uh, it, you know, it can be hard to shake loose, all right? So false memories kind of get in there, okay? The word sleep kind of worked its way in there subtly from hearing a bunch of words that related to it, and boom, it's become a false memory. So this is all related to some very classic work. There's a very famous memory researcher named Elizabeth Loftus, who's the big name. She's one of the gods in memory research. And um, she did a classic study with a colleague back in 1974, a pair of studies. And um, um, they, they both, the part one and part two of the study had to do with a motor, had participants, you know, um, view a, a, a video of a car accident, okay? And... Um, so they watched a video of two cars just, you know, you know, hit each other, okay? And a week or two later, they were brought into the lab and given a surprise memory test to ask details about the, about the accident, okay? So they were asked, how fast were the cars, estimate how fast the cars were going when they, and they, and they used five different verbs, okay? How fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other, collided into each other, bumped into each other, hit each other, or contacted each other, okay? And look at the mean estimates that they got of the speed, all right? So when the person heard the word smashed, that led them, that helped lead them to believe that the cars were going a little better than 40 miles an hour. Contrast that with the other, at the far end here, contacted. A word, you know, smashed versus contacted. It sounds like a gentler kind of word, doesn't it, okay? Well, words matter is the moral of this little of this study here, okay? So they all saw the same video. They all had the same delay. They were randomly read one of, or spoken one of these five words, okay? And so the, the question was exactly the same except for the verb, all right? Smashed, collided, bumped, hit, and contacted. And it resulted in this, in this dec ever-declining um, estimate of the speed, all right? These are significantly different. Um, speeds between many, several, you know, smashed and hit and smashed and contacted, for example. Those are, you know, what we call statistically significantly different estimates, all right? So, you know, about 10 miles per hour difference, okay? All watch the same video. That was part one of the study. Um, in part two of the study, they were uh, different participants were were shown uh, a similar, uh, if not the same, video of cars hitting each other, and they were um, they, they this time they were asked the question. You know, they didn't ask the question how fast they were going, but they said when the cars smashed into each other or hit each other, or you know, they used different these different words again. Um, do you know, do you remember seeing broken glass? Okay, so when the cars smashed into each other, do you remember seeing broken glass? When the cars hit each other, do you remember seeing broken glass? All right, and again, the words mattered. Okay, participants who heard words like smashed and collided were far more likely to remember, to falsely remember broken glass. There was no broken glass in the video. Okay, you didn't see any windows or reflectors or lights or anything being broken. All right, no broken glass. And they were significantly more likely to misremember, to falsely remember broken glass when they were s simply asked, and you, when, they, when the word smashed or collided was used, versus when they reused the word hit or contacted. Okay? So, what happens at the present greatly can impact what we remember about the past. All right? So, and she's had a whole career of research. Um, associated with this kind of stuff. So, here's another. Here's a here's a clip of her talking about a, um, a version of a, another classic study. Okay, the classic version of her study was that she, um, through the by getting the you know permission and the agreement of parents, um, you can ask, you can decide yourself if this was a very ethical thing to do. Um, they would, with the permission of parents, they would. Um, they would tell a little fib to their children, okay? And, and, and they would conjure up a story about them being lost when they were like five or something in a, in a shopping mall. Now, this never happened, but she got them to agree to like pretend that it did, all right? So she and their parents would ask questions of the now grown up kid, maybe a teenager in their 20s or something, okay? So, you know, years and years later, um, 
you know, bring up this story about being lost in the mall and how they got separated and, you know, and that a, a, a store employee, a security guy, you know, found the child and, you know, and then they announced it on the radio, on the, on the speaker or something like that. And the parents came and, you know, anyway, so it's never happened. And then they started asking the kids, these grown up kids now, about the details of that memory. <coughs> Excuse me. And perhaps not surprisingly, after you hear all this, the children, these later, you know, no longer children, had memories, false memories of the event. They recalled very vivid things they had made up and conjured, you know, just in the course of doing this over a few days. The more they did it, the more real it became to them. At first, they just like, no, I don't remember this. But then they would repeatedly bring this story up. And in a matter of days or short weeks, um, the people went from not having any memory of it because it never happened to having a very clear, you know, embellishing certain details, like remembering what the security guy looked like or what he wore. Okay, so here's her describing a very similar version of this. One of the things that uh, I and my colleagues did is to try to get people to remember that they met and shook hands with Bugs Bunny at Disneyland. This would be impossible because Bugs is a Warner Brothers character and wouldn't be allowed okay. at Disney. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, but, and so how do we get people to believe that? We give them an ad to evaluate. So here's a fake ad for Disney, and you can see Disney in the castle, and there's Bugs. And they, they review the ad. They just tell us how much they like it. Do they like the colors? Do they like the layout? It, mm -hmm. But later on, when we say, tell, tell us about your, your, one of your childhood trips to Disney, which characters do you remember meeting? Do you remember meeting Mickey Mouse, Minnie Mouse, The Little Mermaid, Bugs Bunny? We will get lots of people to tell us they remember meeting Bugs. Oh. And then when they get pressed for details, they'll say they shook his hand, they'll say they touched his tail, they'll say he, he was eating, one said he was eating a carrot, <laughs> one said, you know, a few said he said... So it becomes uh, real. It becomes real. Oh, they, they embellish it with detail, and it looks every bit like a real memory, Yeah. even though it couldn't have happened. Okay, yep, yeah, Bugs Bunny. Um, isn't part of Disney World, so you're not going to see Bugs Bunny at uh, at any Disney World ever, okay? And unless there's until someday when there's a merger between Looney Tunes and and Disney, which wouldn't surprise me if someday there is a merger, okay? The way corporate giants always merge, but to, so far they're separate entities. Okay, so uh, I'm going to close now um, by showing you a video clip of another big famous psychologist working in memory at Harvard, a guy named Dan Schachter. So here's um, our good sport, Alan Alda, going to visit with uh, Dan Schachter. And Dan's going to um, test uh, poor Alan's memory and, as you're going to see, induce some false memories. And, and one of the false memory tasks is going to now look very familiar to you. So let's watch good old Alan Alda fall for um, this, this memory um, the false memory task as well, okay? Um, so, I'll close with that. Start seeing bits and pieces of their life. What I didn't know one pleasant morning while strolling with Dan Schachter was that in collaboration with my scheming producers, he was setting me up for a test of my memory. Now we're just going to witness a simple picnic scene. We want you to pay attention to how often either of the folks gets up and down. Mm -hmm. So whenever someone gets up and down, you just make a, a mental note of it. Okay. I knew Dan Schachter to be a noted memory researcher, but this picnic was a surprise. Mm -hmm. Do you like some pasta? Yeah. Oh, good. I love to watch people eat. Although Dan had told me to keep track of how many times the picnickers stood up, I suspected there was more to this little scene than that. But what? I wasn't to find out for another two days that the picnic was part of a carefully choreographed attempt to implant false memories into my brain, to make me remember as real things I'd never seen. At the time, it was like trying to keep track of a very bad play while sitting uncomfortably close to the author. Oh, it's cold. After 10 so bewildering go. minutes, the picnic mercifully came to an end. Very nice. Well done. Very nice. 
Well, it could use a little more high drama here and there. Yeah, yeah. no, but it doesn't lack for slowness. It's good. <laughs> At this point, I was politely asked to leave. Starting with R. The scene was played over for a stills photographer. But this time, it included things that had never happened while I was there. Ignore the sun. Which means okay. I also missed Dan Schachter's basic premise, okay, that memories right are malleable. One of the things that we know about memory is that it's not fixed at the original experience we have. The way we talk about the event later, uh, the way we think about it, uh, can affect, improve, or sometimes change our memories. And photographs are one everyday source of reviewing past experiences that may have a, a potent effect on memory, and we're interested in exactly what that effect is. Great, thanks. I want you to look at each of these for about 10, 20 Two days seconds. later, I was in Dan Schachter's office at Harvard you know, University looking at photographs. Can get cut out? Is it well-centered? For each photo, I'm going to ask you for a one to five rating. Oh, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> see, part of me is trying to figure out what this is really a test of. I'd have to say, uh, you know, four... Four, four, for, four to 4.5. Okay, you know, it's sense. a nicely composed picture. For I didn't believe this no, rating ploy for a minute. But I graciously played along, even when I knew the photos were of things I hadn't seen. I take it you don't want me to mention whether or not this was a picture of something that happened or not, because this never happened. Right, we're not concerned with that okay. right now, we're just concerned with your... Just showing you how smart I am. <laughs> right. In all, I looked at about 20 photographs. Finally, the moment I'd been anticipating. Fishing pole. The test. No. The question is, did I see these things at the picnic or not? Umbrella. No umbrella, no. <laughs> potato chips. No, the potato chips were in the picture. Well, I remember them in the picture, but I don't remember them on the site. Okay, so you're going to call I was doing yeah. fine until... Um, nail file. Yes, I think I remember her filing her nails, although... The picture is, is also vivid in my mind, but I think I think I remember her filing her nails too. Kite. No kite. No, there was no kite. There was a kite in the picture, but that's it. Okay. A man's cap. Dan was obviously trying to confuse my memory of things I'd seen for real. I think he wore a cap. With things I'd only seen in the photographs. Well, see. I think he was wearing a cap in the photographs, and I think and I remember when I looked at the photograph, there's something wrong with this picture. I don't think he wore a cap, okay, no. So. A bottle of water? Yes, there was a bottle of water. Uh-oh, uh this would come back okay. to haunt me. Folding chairs? No. No, no way. Pasta? Yes. You think I could forget pasta? <laughs> come on. It's over. Yeah, that's it? It's, that's it. It's out of so your system. So it had nothing to do no with more. how many times they stood up. Well, that was just to get you to pay attention to the, what was going on in yeah, front of you. That's why I paid attention to everything else. Now, what I'm really interested to know is, were you able to place in my memory things that never occurred in real life yes. by using the photographs? You did? We you did. did? Even though, um, even though we, you know, we, we told you, you knew what the game was. Yeah. You knew that some of the things that we were showing you in the photographs had never happened. <laughs> Despite this is, that... This is horrible. One was <laughs> the nail file. Yeah. That was only in the photo. You know, when I first saw the nail file, I, there was as little uncertainty. Is that real or isn't it? And then a second later, I, I was sure I had seen it. In the final tally of eight things that appeared in the pictures only, I wrongly remembered two as having been at the picnic, the nail file and the bottle of water. The photographs had somehow lodged in my brain right along with my memory of the picnic itself, and I couldn't tell which was which. To understand how this can happen, we have to first understand where in the brain memory is located. Is it possible to point to some place on the brain and say that's where memory is? Well, there's no one place. There's no one place I can point and say, there's your memory for high school graduation, yeah. and there's your memory for having eaten breakfast yesterday. Instead of being in one place, uh, many of us believe that the memory is kind of scattered in different parts of the brain. The idea is that memory consists of all the bits and pieces of an experience, the sights, the sounds, the emotions, with each fragment stored in areas of the brain responsible for handling that particular sensation. So sounds are stored in the auditory cortex, sights in the visual cortex, and so on. Keeping track of what's where is a region of the brain called the hippocampus, which functions as a sort of index for our memories. 
Recalling an event means reassembling all those bits and pieces. It's not like replaying a videotape. It's more like shaking a kaleidoscope. With every shake, every recall, the pieces fall together anew. Sometimes, as in my memory of the picnic, including bits that don't quite belong. Okay, so here's the first list. Dan Schachter recently wondered if he could tell the difference between real and false memories by peering into the brain while it was remembering. Twelve people heard word lists like these, and they had to remember as many of the words as they could. Writer. Um, gravel, What's sneaky about the lists is that while they're each united by a theme, they don't contain the most obvious word. Bed, rest, awake, tired, dream, wake, snooze, blanket, doze, slumber, snore, nap, peace, yawn, drowsy. Sleep, doze, bed, awake. There, right off the bat, I said sleep. But sleep wasn't on the list. Again, I'd been given a false memory. Uh, bed. The 12 experimental subjects all got PET scans while doing this test. Recalling both true and false memories mostly involved the same bits of brain, especially the hippocampus, the index region. But while the true memory lit up the auditory cortex, the false memory didn't. So even though the subjects reported hearing the words that weren't there, their brains appear to contain no trace of the sounds of the words. So in a way, you really can look inside somebody's brain and tell whether they're having a true memory or a false memory uh, under certain conditions. Under certain conditions, within this one experimental paradigm in a group of, of 12 people, we were able to see uh, some differences uh, between true and false recognition. Dan Schachter emphasizes there's a long way to go before this first faint trace of a false memory can be turned into a practical test that could be used, for instance, in a courtroom. Meanwhile, discovering how easily my memory can be tricked was less than enough for me. What I think that this really brings home to me is it's very important to say not, this is what happened, but it seems to me that I remember this is what happened. I think that's a very important lesson.